semiotic intensities, affect, um, you know, how you move into um, the categories of phantasm, the economies of ecstasy, the economies of delirium, um, the economies of experience. And the, the question that came up at the end of the last discussion, which is sort of posing um, Nietzsche's, you know, kind of categories of lived experience and the, the, um, the materiality of his poor old body, <laughs> as opposed to... He was a lovely girl. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sorry, I just couldn't <laughs> Obviously, the guy's never given birth, or <laughs> he's never going to give birth, so he doesn't really you know, understand that. But in, in terms of you know, his kind of obsessions, as opposed to the, uh, the interest of Klosarski in the afterlife, and the, you know, the non-corporeality of of the intellect or, you know, the economy of, of those two mm. things. And why Kosowski is perhaps interested in someone who's very much about the economy of corporeality. So there's those kinds of uh, questions and also then, yeah, the articulation of that, the, the functioning of the song. And so <coughs> that is something that you could start off thinking about, um, just in terms of summarising what people have asked. Um, <laughs> well, we could we could start with that while everyone else sort of gears up to these things. Um, um, firstly, I've just admired your, your paper enormously, and um, uh, I, the question that I had related to the question of, of the human uh, that you mentioned at various sort of points, and uh, it reminded me of that moment in. Um, the Vicious Circle book, where Klosowski, after having <coughs> spoken a lot, as we've indicated today, about uh, gregarity and the gre gregarity of the species, he talks about the l'espèce throughout the thing. At one point, he, he alludes in some way, I can't quite remember, to the, the future of the species. Um, but he finishes a chapter rather abruptly and says uh, in French, mais qu'importe l'avenir de l'espèce? You know, well, what does it matter, the future of the species? You know, who gives a monkey's <laughs> Um, and it's quite shocking, of course, because you know it doesn't seem to be done ironically. And um, it, bearing that sort of um, moment in mind, I was wondering whether the perspective you were opening up there through landscape and everything you were talking about in relation of the the body as a sort of a continuum with a landscape, landscape, and there being no real inside or outside, no kind of set of limits that that can really differentiate one side from the other. Whether whether this opens a perspective that is beyond the human, are we beyond a humanism of any kind whatsoever in this reading of Nietzsche? Uh, is it, I mean, 
mean, the, we get terms like transhuman, which come up, but I, I don't want to use that. Is it, is it something that's just divorced from the perspective of the human, or is it a kind of a liminal humanism where we're at the edges of the human, uh, looking out beyond it, but can never quite detach ourselves from it? I mean, I, I just wondered how you thought about this category of the human there, given that the transvaluation of you know, mm. man, humanity, is so central to, to Nietzsche's thinking. Mm. Seems to me that the human is an adjective as much as anything else in uh, you know, Nietzsche's thinking. And of course, he, he talks about the ubermensch, and that's certainly gone in a, in a, sort of a certain direction that um, you know French philosophers have you know attempted to sort of uh, wrest Nietzsche from because he's clearly not talking about some you know blonde beast rampaging across <laughs> Europe, but um, is really asking about um, you know, the, the human animal. And I think this does connect with the, the wonderful things that Deleuze does um, when you know, he reads Nietzsche and um, you know, on uh, reactivity and uh, suggests that we've only really known the reactive human, the reactive animal, and so when Nietzsche's talking about nobility, or indeed talking about the over-human, you know, this isn't something that's actually been sort of realised, um, and what would, what, you know, what would a, a human being sort of, you know, freed of, of ressentiment be like? And presumably the eternal return is, is, is going to go in the direction of um, of that, but it would have to be about cultivating a new body, and it would have to be about incorporating active values. Uh, and you know, there's a there's a lot um, in Nietzsche's notebooks uh, uh, about this, and so it um, it wouldn't really be that sort of that liminal model. Um, of, of, of the human and, and, and humanism, so so much as as, as one of um, cultivating new instincts, you know. And so when Nietzsche talks about incorporating this thought of, <coughs> thought of eternal return, um, it's it's very very radical. Um, and, and you know, you, as anyone who's tried to, to to work on Nietzsche knows, you can't lift one bit out and and sort of stay stay with it because um, you know, ev ev everything everything is shifting in Nietzsche's thinking and Klosowski I think is you know is alert to that um, although Klosowski doesn't use that language of becoming of course Nietzsche is you know thinking about that um, philosophy of utter becoming so um, the human uh, would would be you know, some, something to um, you know, submit to critique in the way in which 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 Nietzsche Nietzsche does, and the thought of eternal return would be, you know, a, a, a glimpse of you know, something you know, beyond beyond mm. the human. Mm. But what would that be? You know, and that's the. You know, that's it's the interesting you talk about the, the a new body because it reminded <coughs> me of. Um, an exchange that um, between, I think, Deleuze and Klosowski in the 1972 Nietzsche conference, when they were all at Saoise La Salle, gathered together with Lyotard and, and, and Derrida and, and a whole bunch of others. And I think it's Deleuze who says, we need to invent a new body. Um, this is sort of three years after the publication of The Vicious Circle. And so that I think one of the things they're taking from that is the idea that we need to rethink the body and, and invent a new kind of body, but what, it's one without limits, mm -hmm. in, in, in the kind of way that you're, mm -hmm. you're suggesting. That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> does, that, does that mean that the body now is the body of Well, I, I, I mean, my, my thinking is that, that, um, that Deleuze at that moment is sort of is meditating something that will become the body without organs. And the relationship between the corps fortuit, the, the fortuitous body, and the vicious circle text and Deleuze's body without organs is worthy of, of, of investigation and thinking because I think they are sort of connected in some way. Um, I'm not sure that he was actually. I don't think so. 
it's quite a long guest list, and uh, it, but no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about um, the, the nature of language that's what we've been talking about. A lot, a lot of the material <coughs> you've been talking about has been about the, the limitations uh, that language has given its basis in, say, identity thinking. So, there's also this fiction. It you know, moves away from Aristotle's three unities and it moves to a structure which is, deals with heterogeneous terms rather than identities and the self is dissolved. And I, th I was we've been talking about language that's moved to a different kind of language as a way of describing the world more appropriately, a more appropriate way of uh, getting a parallel between language and the way the world is. And I sort of wonder whether there was another moment to Nietzsche's thinking, <coughs> the sort of use of language to maybe try and, in some sense, change the world. So, in, in some sense, when he's writing <coughs> Zarathustra, for instance, part of the aim of Zarathustra is to use language to like, herald the coming of the open arm, whatever, whatever. So I just, I just kind of wanted to know what you thought about that other side of language, which is a lot more about affect and action, rather than this kind of, rather than a kind of, almost like a mimesis of difference. Mimesis of difference, I think, is what the primary focus seems to be. It seems like there is another aspect, too. Shall I? Mm. I do have an answer. Yeah, okay. yeah no, I can stand here. An, an, an answer. Yeah. An answer. Um, <coughs> it's, a very, it's a very good question, and I wonder whether perhaps the, 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 the answer could be a bit of a lame one, is to say that those two possible oppositions are interconnected. So, I, I mean, I think Dan put it wonderfully well earlier when we were talking about, when he, when he responded to my question about Klosowski and the Code des Signes, is that however sort of codified or gregarious language may get, how it might want to tie itself to instrumental reason or all these sort of things that it, we might want to detach it from, it's always already embedded and arising from the world of affects and intensity. It's already, it's always, always in it and so those things will always, uh, always, you know, sort of inhabit language in a way and we, we've approached that. So the question then is, you know, how might we best not necessarily find a, a mimesis of difference, although that, that is a good way of putting it, but how might a linguistic strategy or a strategy of thought best come to some affirmation of its always already being embedded in this, this world of intensity and affect? Um, one could then argue that if it manages to do that successfully in that, that sort of affirmation, and, and this is where you, we, we run into the discussion today about this being fraught with all sorts of paradox and possible self-defeating contradictions, etc. But if it's always already embedded in the world of intensity and affect, you kind of always already win. It's just about putting language back into that world affirmatively and, 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 and sort, of, sort of in a kind of lucidity, even if it's a lucidity that's excluded by the very thought that, that it's trying to affirm, which goes back to Nietzsche, uh, sorry, Klosowski. So once you've done that, I mean, one could argue that you have then freed thought from a certain kind of servitude to its illusions, its metaphysical illusions, its illusions of, of transcendence, of, of unity, um, of it, its being tied to all forms of, of kinds of rationality, etc. And that's when you might be able to move to action. It's kind of a liberating moment. You've liberated thought by having sort of found some affirmative gesture to ground thought back from where it comes, which is the ungrounding of intensity and affect. And then you're no longer tying um, conceptual presentation or, or, or discursive presentation to the illusions of metaphysics. And then you can create and act in all sorts of multiple ways. And, and, and that's where one side of your question flips over into the other. They're not in opposition to it. In a sense, when you're talking about language, you're I was trying to, yeah. yeah. Although I didn't get as far down to the, the other the other side, which is that actually once you've successfully, if you have successfully, if, once you've found a kind of a, a performative gesture of affirming this radical 
irreducible multiplicity within being existence, what follows from there, sort of in terms of the kind of thing that, that Henry was asking about? Because it possibly is true that, as, as Dan said earlier, that Klosowski sort of stops at this moment of creations of, of, of simulacra, all the obsessive paintings, all the obsessive kind of repetitions of motifs, and it's, he's interested in the power of the phantasm, but as when you said he spoke to Foucault and suggested that riot police could be defeated by a phantasm of young, semi-naked young men. Well, we you know, now. Well, <laughs> no, no, it, could, it could well be. Could well be. So, so Klosowski perhaps goes up to a certain point in his practice and then one, one might need to move his insights further into some different realm. Well, let me, sort of something in response to that, that's also in response to Jill's paper, which has sort of got me thinking because, um, question on language, but like the, the notion of the world, like when we talk about metaphysics, Kant said like the three great terminal points of metaphysics are the self, world, and God. And there's a lot about self and God, but world, <laughs> I don't know, for us, because of science, it like winds up in place, which is uh, like uh, why well, I like your stuff about geography and landscape because Nietzsche A talks about the death of God so he sort of deals with that although that's not like God doesn't exist it means gods are created and born and then they die so the question is how are gods born and how are they dying he creates his own God which is Dionysus so he's by no means not religious in fact I think there's a text at the end of Will to Power where he says you know sometimes the God forming instinct in me is so powerful I can you know, do two or three gods before breakfast um, <laughs> Uh, but then, yeah, so he d addresses that, and then the self, you know, we get all this stuff of intense, you know, sort of destroying the self but resurrecting it in a new way. But somewhere like the world still exists out there as this, just this thing. And then when we talk about language, like it's often, well, how do we link up language with the world? It's referential. I mean, much as we try, we can rethink God and the self, but we haven't done the world <laughs> in, in a large degree. And that's what I thought I really liked about your... Um, your paper, and even phenomenology, which does, you know, says there's a difference between geography and landscape, because geography is just kind of the abstract world out there. A landscape has horizon and figure ground, but it's still indexed on a subject in the world or a body in the world. So phenomenology was still, the landscape is, is organized around the body. It wasn't like the world in and of itself. And I'm not sure where to take this, but this is exactly what your paper seemed to be going toward, which I thought was great. Like, it's not just, it's not just Nietzsche, the subject, finds certain ge geographical places interesting, because that would just mean the landscape is reflected in the subject. Like, it has to be some reconception of the nature of the world. And I'm not quite sure where to go with that, but that's sort of a question I wanted to pose off to you, because it's partly linked with language, and if language stops being just a way of denoting either the world out there or my desires and feelings or something, that it's something itself in the world, then we have to... The notion of the world, we've done self and God, <laughs> but we haven't had done with the world yet. One of your relations about is the world, strictly speaking, as it is, um, <coughs> You're asking me? Yeah. That's completely clear to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, I, I mean, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, that's what Deleuze says, right? Being is problematic, so it poses problems. So no, it's of course not completely intelligible. As well. Although that's even, um, Kant already says that when he critiques the note. No, Kant already says the world is a transcendent illusion. There is no such thing as the world. We can think it. Exactly, it's going towards the category. Yeah, but we can't know. Although that's coming out of causality as a, you know, well, category. Well, and so it's a slightly well, different question, you know, the world as a whole, but I think it's also, you know, he says that's a scientific ideal, you know, science does this and that and that, we have this idea of the whole, which is what motivates us to take these empirical results here and here and presume that nature is a system and everything works together, but he says even that, that's an idea, that's nothing given in the world, we don't know everything works together, we don't know there's laws of nature. I mean, John Wheeler is a, a physicist at uh, Princeton, because, you know, for all we know, the speed of light is speeding up, for all we know, the laws of nature themselves evolve if we take evolution seriously, that things are changing, you know, it's just the idea of regularity or the universality of laws of nature. That's our, you know, it's the, so to rethink actually what the world is in, that, in this sort of Nietzschean context and saying, you know, I found it fascinating, Nietzsche has lists of places where he can think 
and other places where he can't. And it can't just mm. be him. You know, it's not just a subjective response. I like this place better than another place. Whether it's actually electricity in the sky or, or what, I don't know. But um, they sound almost like moments of intelligibility within a fundamental unintelligibility, as far as intelligibility is premised on the un unintelligibility of the world, as it is. Maybe if you take seriously the idea that thought, we don't originate thought, like thoughts come to us, Nietzsche says this, you know, talked about that. then there are places where that thought flow, you know, you know he says, oh, you got to pull things out and you can say, like he was, that's, his, that's why I was asking that question, his history of places where his thoughts came to him and then he used those thoughts that came to him, pull them out, develop them, put it in his work, but it's as much an intellectual history of his own as a, as a literal geography, something overall, I and mean, that's the world as a kind of, place where there's this infinite movement of thought taking place that, that flows through us. So I'm just, you know, wildly speculating, but... Um. <laughs> it's tempting to turn to Bergson, I'm sure, with, with the idea of images. Of the, way the world which, is, yeah. The way in which, um, you know, we're set within sets, within sets, within the universe, and our bodies don't end, so we are in a constant dialogue with these places. Some of these images, you know, we react to, and some we don't. Mm. question of where you start from and how you set <coughs> these questions up. Um, there's a lot of difficulty if you begin really with the assumption that we've got the self and the world and then how do we you know, connect, um, connect them. And what fascinates me about Nietzsche is, you know, right at the beginning in Birth of Tragedy, he's sort of beginning somewhere else. You know, he, he, when he's talking about Apple and Dionysian, he says, let's not approach them you know, conceptually, um, but, you know, in, intuitively in terms of these physiological forces, the Apollinian, the Dionysian. And he, he speaks about how we can get a sense of Apple and Dionysian, you know, primarily um, in relation to the, the drive um, to form images and you know, the drive to intoxication. And what he seems to be doing there is talking about imminent activity. So he's using the example of the Apollinian, for example, with that uh, you know, idea of the, the drive to you know, construct um, in terms of dreams, because in dreams, um, you know, the dreams are of us. Um, so we are an agent in, 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 in a sense, um, but it's kind of order without us giving the orders. So you know we we um, you know we, we reflect on our, our dreams, and of course you know they are our our dreams. But there isn't a, a conscious ego that's you know, um, putting putting that all together. He's just starting um, from you know the world or from the body, and so um, it, 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 it's, it's coming from such a, a different place 
the, those questions of how you're going to sort of connect, um, you know, self and world and, and um, you know, agency, you know, aren't couched in, in that way. He certainly does think that you know, his philosophy is going to, to have, you know, have a world historic effect and that people will be influenced by his thought to do things and you know of course I, I, I think that that's that that's that that's right um, but um, he isn't setting things up in terms of um, you know just decisionistic action um, but he, it still enables him to talk about how um, Worlds originate. Uh, so you've, you know, you've got um, you know, an, an, an account of agency, but it's an account of agency within you know, sort of these broader sort of, you know, um, forces of becoming, if, if you like. You can have love. He's, he's feeling it, you know. I mean, the the, uh, <coughs> the example from um, the Wonder in His Shadow at, at noon, which seems to me to just you know have that um, more farty um, feel to it. I mean, of course, later in Esche Homer, when he's talking about how one becomes what one is, he uses very similar language about looking at you know at the future like a, a sea unruffled with any desire, or, you know. I want the thing to be other than it is. I don't want myself to be other than you know it, than it is. Um, but uh, back to that pa that passage, um, it's uh, you know as a, as a a sense of um, like you know co-emergence with with the world. You haven't got someone struggling to stoically reconcile <coughs> himself with with something. Um, and the, the sort of, you know the the human sort of world kind of sort of dichotomy. If we if 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 we sort of you know start from there, it's always going to be a question of you know how you know how we hook them up together. And I just think that Nietzsche is coming from you know a, you know a, a much richer sort of, you know, physicality. Oh, I, I accept the word, but it just seems. The decisional aspect, for instance, within the other term, the nature of affirmation itself. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not just physicality. Can I? Because I think Klosowski in the Vicious Circle text meets that head on. Yeah. When he, he broaches the, the sign of the vicious circle and the, the yeah. idea of living under the sign of the vicious circle, and if you evoke Amor Fati, he, he I think he quotes um, a bit of Nietzsche where um, <coughs> eternal return is Gloucester's, um, thus it was, and so will I will it. Yeah. And um, Klosowski has his thinker uh, sort of going through every stage of their life and willing every moment of their life, consciously, decisionally, <coughs> to have it always been thus, and going through all the series until they get to that moment where they decided to do that. And then you hit the moment of paradox, because you are consciously, <coughs> decisionally willing your own self to be determined by something else. And so it, that, that, that the kind of paradoxical moment that you're, you're isolating there is at the very heart of 
the book because it's the sign of the vicious circle. And, and, and what happens at that moment, I think, is everything for Klosowski because it changes <coughs> the nature of the self. And rather than <coughs> the way that perhaps you've suggested it being the idea that we're suddenly always locked in volition and voluntarism or, or decisionism or whatever and the consciousness wins, what the outcome for Klosowski is, is that what, what's revealed there is that however much we have a moment of conscious agency and decision, you always feel it, that actually that moment is always predetermined by prior intensity or affect. And it's a paradoxical motif which kind of affirms that and then affirms itself as that. It remains resolutely paradoxical, but it, it's, it's that moment that, that Klosowski latches onto to articulate what Jill has just said about coming from a different space, sort of a space other than that of conscious decision, if you like. So, so that sorry, moment's sorry, always sorry, there sorry, in the, in the sorry, picture. Sorry? sorry. It's deterministic in the sense um, that, as you know, kind of we've been saying, thought always arises from the passions and intensities and, and affects, and, and that's thought is always rooted back in into those. It's, it, in a sense, thought is always determined in the last instance, if you like, by its rootedness in intensities and affects. So one could say yeah, that, perhaps. I don't know if that sounds the viable way of putting it. Yeah, no, I agree with that entirely. I would just say something going one step back is like, you know, the genealogy of morals is more or less saying, look, every, if everything is drives, and that's, they're the only real agents, then the question is, where does our conception of agency? Our, he would say, like, who, what drive wants agency, like thinks this is an important thing to have, this self who's going to be responsible, and makes decisions and has free will. Like, where does that idea come from? It's got to be a drive underneath it. And he says, well, that's what the genealogy is about. That's our morality, a Western It's a reactive morality. It's. When it does become conscious, it's the point that man becomes an interesting man. Yeah, but then he also, you know, he says drives aren't static, right? They're constantly, it's a will to power they want to push, but then how can they overcome themselves and revert to something else? So, how does nihilism overcome itself? by pushing it to its limits. So essentially, you know, genealogy is, here's the drive to resentiment, like, and that's giving life a value of nil. At what point does it overcome itself? Here's a reactive drive to produce an agent who's going to be conscious, moral, and responsible. That's our morality that he wants to overcome. And I think what Ian was just saying, well, then there's the point where that will that has been produced, even it's a fiction, it has a reality as a fiction, can nonetheless overcome itself by willing the eternal return, which in the process of willing, destroys this very will and agency that are reactive, the results of this reactive morality, and becomes something other. So every drive producing its own fictions but overcoming itself. So I think he does that with nihilism, and that's what you're saying, he does it with the will and agency. I agree, I agree with you, it's just yeah. that it expresses precisely the moment in which there is um, the capacity to affirm itself in its overcoming of its uh, condition of resulting it's that capacity that's developed out of this genealogy, but it's still there. But it's still a drive, I think, to answer the question. It's a drive that's pushing this well, in the end, I think. Well, it's something else, isn't it? It's quality. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, exactly. Drives, drives are constant. It's just talking about drives. It's something else. It's the nature of the class. If the organism has become more complex, there's a qualitative division at the point that it, <laughs> Well, I inject a little Deleuze, because Deleuze has this term that's translated as assemblage, but the French word is agencement. So it's, it's his way of talking about agency. Agency is always assembled. It's always something not individual, it's collective. And I think if you look in Nietzsche's writings, I mean, he says this, the drives, there's no like wild, free, unbound, to use that for an interim state of the drives, like the drives are always ranked, they're always in a hierarchical order, and what is it that hierarchizes the drives? Well, it's morality, and that's what he thought was most lacking in his time, was a comparative 
study of different moralities because the moralities rank our drives in different ways. In a warrior culture, it's aggressiveness. For us, it's you know, acquiescence. Or you know, consumer society will have a different ordering of the drives than another one. So the drives are never natural in that sense. Morality is nothing other than the ranking of the drives, and therefore the agent that makes my drives organized in the way they're organized you know, is morality in Nietzsche's sense, but it's social already to some degree. And in Deleuze's sense, that's, I think, part of what he means by agile smaller assemblage. It's never individual. It's always collective. You talked about overcoming, that you would agree that there, although he wants to overcome a particular morality and be aware of what's being oppressed, um, <coughs> there's still a notion that the free spirits, future philosophers, in the child, who also be doing something. So, so what's necessary and important? But this ranking isn't something that can be overcome. Yeah. Done differently, but... I, mean, I think for Klosowski, the sign of the vicious circle is a way of relating differently to the drives and the life of the drives. And he's not, there's no, um, although he points to eternal return as an experience, Klosowski would never claim for himself some kind of experience of ecstatic self-dispossession or anything like that. He's talking about the doctrine of return as a simulacrum, as we, we talked about, and the sign of the vicious circle. And living under that sign, with all of its logical impossibilities and aporia, mean, means that you proceed <coughs> differently as an agent in relation to the life of the drives, and, and, and with the thought of them being organized differently. I mean, I, that's about how, as far as I can make sense of it in terms of what you're talking about. But I don't know if that resonates with how you read. Okay, read. I thought that was um, just too parallel I was interested in Klosowski speaking about the way in which Nietzsche attempts to initiate friends into, into the thought and there clearly is an obsession or relation to the thought um, and I wanted to add a sense of place into that because there is this like returning to, to the place and on one level obviously you know, perhaps he quite liked taking these ladies there and sitting them on this stone and sort of you know, uh, letting Zarathustra pull forth. So, you know, maybe maybe there's a better motive uh, work there. But um, more, more, more sub seriously, um, it, 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 it is that sense of physicality, because if there's a body which experiences the thought of eternal return, then it's a return to, you know, the body that births the thought, Sills, you know, Sills Maria, Nietzsche's body. I'm sort of, you know, <coughs> as I was, um, as I'm attempting to say, that, that there isn't a kind of Nietzsche's body, and then there's the world. Um, if we're thinking about the body, as Kosovsky suggests in terms of um, you know, 
the locus where these forces or impulses collide, then you know we've got a material nexus, if 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 you like, and it, it's um, you know it's the climate, it's it's sort of weather systems, temperature, Nietzsche's um, you know, uh, attunement, um, you know it's the dark green lake and the fragrance of the you know, the pines. Um, so there's, there's sort of a sense in trying to sort of step back into that, but of course because it's not a place, that's that's never that's never going to 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 work. You're not going to sort of um, you know it's as if we went there, we would like suddenly see it. It's, it's not that kind of kind of thought because it's going to be different um, every every time. But I think there's something, you know, uh, as I say, sort of obsessive about kind of re, you know. Um, returning to that 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 place because um, what are the conditions, the material conditions for production? Um, <coughs> and it seems to me Nietzsche's fascinated with that, philosophically fascinated. It's not something that's you know ancillary to his philosophy, and he's you know he's he's talking about you know going wrong, um, you know making mistakes in in the past. With climate and, and, and diet, and this is why Sils Maria is this discovery for him, where you've got, you know, the the cloudless sky and you know no sense of these sort of um, electrical storms that he was so uh, sensitive to. And, uh, so, so, so that's kind of what's what's going on. It seems to me with that returning. It's part of the transformation of thought through the transformation of the body. He's also a great thought as well. Thoughts come when they will, but great thoughts come when you walk in. I think within the arts, within the arts of his bed, really, there's a, you know, he's in the arts of walk, and you walk like that. <coughs> I mean, so I mean, I'm just kind of, you know, sort of interested in that because, of course, his eyesight was really poor. I mean, not not the best person to be sort of scrambling up around to that <laughs> side. Sort of. um, and and ju just, you know, what 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 that whole way of philosophizing yields, um, because that's how he's how he's thinking. Um, and so, uh, all of these references to heights and depths and uh, altitude and. Um, you know, the, the, the air of the heights. These aren't just metaphors which the you know the beautiful scenery handed to him. I, I you know I don't think it's it's that um, it's that at all. Um, you know it, it, it is about um, you know, the, the conditions in which thought um, you know, is cultivated. Uh, and of course it can't be sort of you know because we haven't got that uh, uh, you know, that model of truth. Um, you know, in places, as, as was said earlier um, today. Um, Can I just add, add to that? Yes. Because I think when I think about the world in relation to the way Klosowski reads Nietzsche, I always um, go back to his reading of the section from Twilight <laughs> of the Idols, how the world became fable, and he yes. moves from philosophy posing the world as truth through to the world as, as fable. And I think this is very <coughs> important for, for Klosowski, because I think... Uh, I love the way the way your thinking sort of gives us back, as you implied, the extent extensivity <coughs> of the world. You know, it's it's, a, it's material extension. But I get the sense that for Klosowski, he picks up on that and suggests that, you know, the world only ever sort of comes to us through fabulous images, through sort of simulacra. Our, our access to a sense of world is 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 somehow kind of always already sort of simulacral or spectral in a certain way, which is why he's interested in myth. And in, in, in all those sort of um, moments of image form which might inhabit <coughs> our thought when we represent the world, because at that part of any representation of the world or ontology, <coughs> there's, a, there's a fabulous form, there's a simulacrum of the world. So one might come to the point then if we reverse it in the way you're suggesting that our attempts to think the world are perhaps more the world thinking us. You know, the world is thinking through us, and the course of life is thinking through us, and, and producing any apprehension we might have of existence in in simulacra, endless round of repetition simulacra without mm. without origin. So for me, that's how the world sort of works via Nietzsche and Klosowski. Mm. Um, 
and it resonates, I think, a little bit with, with what you're saying, or at least what you've said has made me think about it in, in a more rich way. So, mm. so what would you say, because it seems a lot of questions go around this idea, you know, like the question of consciousness. Like the world thinks through us, but it's hard to let go of the idea that even if thoughts come to me and I don't initiate them, nonetheless in that flow, I you know, can choose out something or consciousness intervenes and you become self-aware and I do something or I will to overcome or it seems I mean, Nietzsche has his doubts about consciousness and he says we're entering a phase of the modesty of consciousness, but it seems like for most people it's still this like necessary moment that things have to pass through consciousness. Like it's just, and well, I mean, you have to will it, you have to choose it, you have to do something. And yeah. the doing something means you become well, conscious and aware. Yeah. Intention and consciousness are two I suppose when I'm talking, I'm always, always also talking perhaps more about Klosowski than I am about, about Nietzsche. And we're, yeah. we're sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're quite perfectly okay to sort of work well the two together. But I, you know, from Klosowski, I wonder whether, you, and, and this may be arguable, you know, in purely Nietzschean terms as well, I, I get the sense that there's a sort of a sense of um, ultimately a kind of a, what other thinkers <coughs> might call a kind of a unilaterality or a determination in the last instance. So whatever happens at the moment of conscious decision or intention or whatever, in the last instance it's been, you know, caused by the life of affect and the passions. And even if it comes to sort of modify its sense of how the life of affect and passions might operate, that is also in the last instance unilaterally caused by an arrangement of the, the passions and the drives. And, and I, I mean, I would argue that that's what Nietzsche does. I can see you're, you're trying to develop a different yeah. argument yeah. about that, and that, yeah. that, that sounds very, very, very interesting. But certainly for, for, for Klosowski, I think he ends up in, 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 that, in that mode. It, it means that a modification of, of the human can occur, but it occurs imminently from within that space of, of the passions and the drives. I think we might have to. Uh, Call it a day there because um, we're supposed to be out here at five. Has the red light gone? <laughs> 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 the red light is flashing. So I would like to thank Ian and Dan and Jill for coming. Thank you. And thank thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks. Can I say thanks to Henry and Felicity for organising this? Yeah. opposed to the, uh, the interest of Klosowski in the afterlife and the, you know, the non-corporeality of, of the intellect or you know, the economy of, of those two things and why Klosowski is perhaps interested in someone who's very much about the economy of corporeality. So there's those kinds of uh, 
questions and also then yeah the articulation of that the, the functioning of the song and so <coughs> that is something that you could start off thinking about um, just in terms of summarizing what people have asked well, we could we could start with that whatever else sort of gears up to these things um, modification and how the, the terms of modification and transformation um, are quite uh, are terms that are of interest to many different disciplines in fields today, philosophy, create, you know, creative arts, um, literary studies, critical thinking and so on. So I guess, you know, in terms of thinking about the significance of Kosowski and the significance of Nietzsche, um, the term the terminology that you all three of you use today is, is uh, perhaps where the significance lies. And perhaps this is something that you could talk to each other a bit about um, the economies of those categories that you all mentioned the impulsional, the semiotic, intensities, affects, um, you know, how you move into um, the categories of phantasm, the economies of ecstasy, the economies of delirium, um, the economies of experience. And the, the question that came up at the end of the last discussion, which is sort of posing um, Nietzsche's, you know, kind of categories of lived experience and the, the, um, the material. in relation to Frederick Nietzsche is um, how they um, to co-opt on in his terms was they um, they are uh, the princes of uh uh, firstly I've just admired your, your paper enormously and um, uh, I the question that I had related to the question of, of the human uh, that you mentioned at various sort of points and uh, it reminded me of that moment in um, the Vicious Circle book, where Klosowski, after having <coughs> spoken a lot, as we've indicated today, about uh, gregarity and the gregarity of the species, he talks about the less best throughout the thing. At one point, he, he alludes in some way, I can't quite remember, to the, the future of the species. Um, but he finishes a chapter rather abruptly and says uh, in French, Mais qu'importe l'avenir de l'espèce? You know, well, what does it matter, the future of the species? You know, who gives a monkey's kind of thing? <laughs> Um, and it's quite shocking, of course, because you know it doesn't seem to be done ironically. And um, it, bearing that sort of um, moment in mind, I was wondering whether the perspective you were opening up there through landscape and everything you were talking about in relation of the the body as a sort of a continuum with a landscape, landscape, and there being no real inside or outside, no kind of set of limits that that can really differentiate one side from the other. Whether whether this opens a perspective that is beyond the human, are we beyond a humanism of any kind whatsoever in this reading of Nietzsche? Uh, is it, I mean, the, we get terms like transhuman which come up, but I, I don't want to use that. Is it, is it something that's just divorced from the perspective of the human, or is it a kind of a liminal humanism where we're at the edges of the human, uh, looking out beyond it, but can never quite detach ourselves from it? I mean, I, I just wondered how you thought about this category of the human there, given that the transvaluation of you know, mm. man, humanity, is so central to, to mm. Nietzsche's thinking. Mm. It seems to me that the human is sort of an adjective as much as anything else in, the, in the Nietzsche's thinking. And of course, he, he talks about the ubermensch 
and that's certainly gone in a, in a, sort of a certain direction that um, you know French philosophers have you know attempted to sort of uh, rest Nietzsche 